Hey guys, welcome once again to the George Jet Show. Today we have Eric Ford and he's going to be talking about the life of being an amputee. He is the one foot wonder. Let's give a round of applause for Eric. What's up, Eric? How you doing? I'm fantastic, George. If I was doing any better, it'd be illegal. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Wow, man. You started, started out with a bang. So how, I, li I like that. I like your background. I like that. What is that? What type of motif is that behind you? That's some uh, Asian fusion type of Japanese, I think. It's definitely Asian. But I'll, you, I don't know. We'll you, say it's Jap Japanese. You, you have any Asians in you? Uh, probably. Maybe. <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know. And maybe. Definitely some uh, Native American way back and you know yeah i can be, see that you know, they, i can see they, that. definitely yeah. I, haven't, so, I haven't done my own ancestry yet so oh you, you gotta you gotta try it you gotta try it and see what comes up yeah, yeah. yeah that's right so tell me about yourself your living type of work the music you like and then we can go into the good details but tell us where you're from born and raised in northern new jersey and my hometown is montclair new jersey about 30 minutes outside of Manhattan, across the river. Huh. And yeah, that's where I was born and raised and uh, moved to South Florida in 1998, 99. That's a long time ago. I can't remember. I think it's yeah. 98, 99. So and uh, yeah. I, so you're basically I, a, a Miami guy already. I, I wouldn't go far. I wouldn't go that far. But Not, not that far? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a New Jersey. I'm a New Jersey and who has spent a good part of his life in South Florida. So tell us how you, how, <laughs> how did you lose your leg? And I'm going to put some, show some pictures as you're speaking. Okay. So, uh, moved to Florida. And then in 2007, I got laid off from my job and a bunch of people got laid off from my job. And then I decided to relocate to Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And while I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, um, life was good doing my thing. And, um, my kids were actually living with me at the time temporarily and I went to a friend's house for a party and was actually on the way home from picking the kids up from the babysitter on the way home from the party around 1230 at night. And Atlanta is a very mountainous hilly town. So one of the, I used to live Northern uh, Atlanta in Sandy Springs and on the way home going up a hill and at the crest of the hill, so I couldn't see the other side of the hill until I got to the crest, to the top of the hill. Yeah. And that's when I saw headlights in my windshield. And oh. there, a drunk driver was uh, coming at me, and head I was on. in the left lane. Yep, head on, and I'm on the left. I'm in the left lane, two lanes, so I'm in the left lane. Can't go to the right because there's a car over there, and couldn't go any more to the left because then I'll be over the double line, and I'll be going in the head on oncoming traffic. So I had to make the decision of try to turn and step on the brakes and hold, you know, try to hold my position and try to avoid it. But it wasn't too much avoiding because he was barreling towards me. And this is all within second, like milliseconds. Right. I was at the crest of the, I'd approaching the crest of the hill. He's you already saw the car the already there. The right. Yeah. So he was already coming towards me, moving. I was probably doing maybe 35, 40 miles an hour, you know, speed, speed limit. God knows how fast he was going because. He was drunk and yeah, who knows? Um, and so his car, he had a pickup truck, uh, F-150 and thank God I was driving a Chevy Tahoe, a full size SUV. Mm. Otherwise George and I, George and I wouldn't be having this conversation if I was driving the car. Right. So, so he T-boned yeah. you on the driver's side. Mm -hmm. He basically yeah, just his, cut in. Yep. It, his passenger side drilled into my driver's side and, um, crushed everything from the driver's side, like the door, the fender, the wheel, the front wheel was where the door is supposed to be. That's how the force he pushed everything back into me and the engine and everything was the steering wheel was like up against my chest. I cracked a few ribs from that. I didn't tell you about, but yeah, I cracked a few ribs from the steering wheel and the airbag, uh, exploding into me. And, um, of course the airbag knocked me out and yeah, I was unconscious for a little while until the pain from all the massive, Broken bones woke me up. So was the fracture or fracture of your bone, you said it was a compound fracture? 
Yes. A compound Sorry. fracture means that what? That the, the bone's completely severed. Yeah. Two pieces. Well, it comes, breaks in half and then breaks the skin and comes out of your body. And it comes out of your body. And yes. you think that happened because of the impact or because you were actually break, you know, hitting the brakes and between well, actually, that stress and the hit that happened or or what i believe is because it was the left leg so my right foot was on the brake oh, and that heel yeah the right foot was on the brake that heel got shattered from the shock wave of the two massive vehicles and the left leg which was over there where the like emergency brake would be at um it was so much twisted metal and mm. part of the engine was like pushing into it into the cabin almost got um it. that you know, it's so much pressure. I mean, there's really no telling exactly where did it snap or what Got made it. it snap, but it, yeah, definitely. Um, and probably so, for me, you know, when you're about to impact, you're like, you know, you're like bracing back, and like, you know, everything is tense and right. locked up. And that, the force of that could have been um, making a break too. Making a break. But yes. Now, so did, you, did you pass out when this happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the airbag Hi. from the, the airbag knocked me out. Okay. The airbag exploded in my face, knocked me out, and it didn't break my nose, but it definitely did some damage. I had a bloody nose and two black eyes and, you know, blood was streaming down. But um, but I was out. Uh, I, I can't tell how long I was out because I remember everything. Literally, there's no part of the accident I don't remember until I got knocked out. I saw the impact. I, I was leaning on the horn. I heard all that. And then I was out. The airbag knocked me out. And then I probably didn't, you know, I probably wasn't asleep that long or unconscious that long. Um. Because I, I woke up before the ambulance got there and before the first responders got there. Um, so I was awake and talking to my children in the back seat, making sure they're okay and checking on them. And because they were yelling and screaming and I was worried about them. And I'm like, you guys all right? You see any blood? And my son is the oldest. So I was asking him, son, look, you know, big boy, look at your sister. Is she bleeding? Or he's like, no, we're okay. And I'll, can you move your hands and fingers and feet? And they're like, help you do that. But they were screaming. And I was like, why are you guys screaming? He's like, because daddy, you're screaming. I said, well, yeah, daddy's screaming, but I'm trying to not let them know how much massive amount of pain I'm in. So that you're in. yeah, daddy, daddy's a little hurt. So, you know, I'm going to try to stop screaming for a little while, but you guys don't have to scream with me. You guys could just be quiet. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah. That must've <laughs> yeah. been traumatizing for them. Now, how did you yeah. get out? How did you get out of the car? So the first responders, uh, when they finally got there, because like I said, I, I sat there for a good maybe five or ten minutes before um, any responders came. Some people were there on scene just walking around and trying to figure out how to get us out. But the the impact had crushed the frame and the body in a way where all four doors were jammed shut. So thank God the car didn't burst into flames because we would have never been able to get out. We couldn't get out. All doors were jammed shut. Um, so I, I was awake at least for 10 minutes before any first responders show up and then they started working. Uh, they got the kids out first. They opened up the back of the SUV and, uh, ripped those doors open and pulled the kids over the back seat and got them out. And then they started working on me and they used the, uh, jaws of life and which is, uh, I don't know if you have jaws of life. You ever seen jaws of life? Cause I yes. saw them, but they Big machines, stretch, yeah. yeah, just stretch the frame out and rip the, frame apart basically to get you and out. they had to yep yeah, and they had to use a chainsaw to cut mm. some of the metal that was sticking out and uh so i wouldn't get cut on the way out and that's when they realized how much damage was done to my leg because they knew like my arm was broken because i couldn't move my arm it was floppy all over the place so they knew that was broke and that was the only thing they really know was really broken they couldn't see underneath the dashboard because the dashboard was in my stomach so it was yeah. really hard to see and they couldn't pull me out. And so they knew I was stuck on something. So when they looked under the dashboard, one of the first responders crawled in there and squeezed under there. And he looked up at me and he looked at them. And he's like, yeah, it's going to take a little bit longer. So I knew it had to be pretty bad. And um, I knew I was losing blood, too, because I could smell it. I could smell the uh, I could smell it. I could smell the blood, the scent of it, I guess, the smell of it. Yeah. So it, um, it's, <clears throat> they say it smells like what? Blood when it's. Uh, I, I heard it smells like almonds, and yeah, that's the only thing I can compare it to. It's definitely a distinct scent that I had. That's the only thing I could smell like familiar to would be like almonds. Gotcha. Um, but it was super, super strong because um, it was a lot of a lot of it. Because where the shin bone tore through, 
I thank God I didn't hit an artery, but it was still, you know, blood was steadily coming out, pouring out. Right. So, so once you got to the, I guess, the hospital, tell us about mm-hmm. your recovery. Tell us about the pain you were having um, and then go into the uh, the cleaning and the infections that might have arise from that. So the hospital, uh, yeah, got to the hospital and it wasn't an immediate amputation. Um, they wanted to save the leg because they always if there's a chance to save it. You know, a body part, they want to try and save it right. um, unless there's nothing to save. So it was still it wasn't like my leg was off, but it was still attached and it was just a shin bone broke. So they put a did the first surgery was a put a, a pole or a steel rod in there to try to um, stabilize the uh, shin bone and basically piece the shin bone back together like a jigsaw puzzle because it was, you know, jagged Okay. Um, and try to put it back together. And they did several surgeries of a couple of revisions of that because the, uh, where the shin bone had tore through the wound was, uh, like, a like a hole there still, but it would, it would close up and it would get it good. But, uh, they had to do a lot of skin grafting, taking okay. skin from my, my right thigh and it would take skin from my right thigh and did skin grafts to cover that wound up and try to get it to heal up and close up. Um, and usually your body doesn't reject its own skin or its own tissue. So, um, they had a good chance that it would heal up and, you know, be good. But every surgery they did, it kept opening back up and they could see the hole and they could see straight through to the bone and a rod that was in there, which is not good because the doorway for infection was wide open. Um, so f- several surgeries of that doing skin grafts, um, and they actually tried to use muscle. They took a piece of my groin muscle and tried to use that to close the gap and close the hole up. And my body rejected that body wasn't having none of that. Right. And the cleaning, you had to have a lot of cleaning to try to prevent infection. And because of the way the chin bone tore through, it did a lot of damage to nerve endings. And so a lot of raw nerve endings were exposed. So whenever they did the cleaning, it was an intense pain that got, it's another universe. <laughs> it's another, I was already in pain anyways, because I had the broken shin bone, my broken arm. You can see my scar right there. <laughs> So I had a mm-hmm. broken shin bone, I had to put a plate and screws in my arm, um, and then my broken heel. So I had, you know, a couple of major bro- breaks, and those were all healing, and, you know, that's part of the healing process, the pain from those. But there was no other pain that was like my leg, my shin, when they were able to clean it, my shin bone, because... It was just another take, level. Yeah, another level, another universe in the multiverse of pain. I was stuck there for at least two months. Mm. And... um. It would take two, two or three nurses to, to hold me down while the other nurse and doctor would try to clean it and make sure there's no infection in there. And it got to the, it got to the point where, mm. you know, I don't know if they were tired of me screaming my eyeballs out because I, <laughs> I was screaming because they really yeah. couldn't give you nothing for the pain. Right. So I was basically was screaming the entire time while they're cleaning it and holding me down. And it got to the point where, you know, my, you know, they're doing my blood pressure and all that. And like, yeah, he's going to have a freaking stroke if he keep doing it like this. So they started actually giving me anesthesia and putting me under almost like I'm having surgery and they would put me under to clean it. So I wouldn't be in so much pain. Wow. And they had to do that several times too. So I have, as I tell a lot of people like, yeah, I'm not a big fan of drugs, but yeah, sometimes you need them <laughs> That's right. yeah, at, yeah. at that point. So, yeah, I was like, thank God for anesthesia. <laughs> right. You had the pain. They tried to recover your leg, um, the infection. What happened? I, how did you go so, from having a leg and then not having it? I mean, what 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 was the transition right there? Because you're telling me a good thing, so, all of the pain, <laughs> but what happened there? Something happened. So at the end of uh, the surgeries, we got to like surgery number like 10 or 11 and still was not having any luck getting that wound to close up wound was determined to open it back up every two or three days. And then the last surgery, I woke up out of surgery and the, uh, I was at Emory, uh, uh, that Grady Memorial hospital, which is a learning hospital in Atlanta. So they had a lot of, uh, what do you call them? Student doctors, you know, doctors and, uh, their internships or, you know, they're doctors, but they're not practicing yet. So they got the re- the real surgeons and doctors. And so 
the young guy had been with us the whole time. He'd been telling me all this good stuff and trying to keep my hopes up. And um, I thought, I'm just happy to be alive. So whether I keep the leg or not, but he's like, oh, we're going to save it. We're going to save it. So he came in after surgery, 10, 11. And he came in and it was like tears streaming down his face. And he's out, Mr. Ford, I'm sorry. And the, the senior surgeon was there too. And he was not so upset, but you know, he's like, yeah, unfortunately it happens. And you got a, a major infection in the wound. And only way we can save it is to get like a cement antibiotic rod and install that and take that steel rod out and put the antibiotic cement rod in. And maybe we might be able to kill the infection and, you know, you could keep the leg. And so I just want, my only question was, well, how am I going to walk? But like, yeah, it's going to be a pain, painful walk for the rest of your life. You'll be, every step will be painful and the doorway for infection is going to stay open. Hmm. I was like, okay. So the other option B is we do amputation. And the only thing I wanted to know, because I've been in pain the entire time in the hospital. So for two months, going on three months, I was like, how much is this going to hurt? And they're like, oh, well, the part that's hurting you right now, where the wound is at, we're going to cut that off. That'll be the amputation part. So you won't be in pain from that. But you'll just have be in pain from recovery and healing from the uh, from the bone and the blood vessels and the muscles and all that healing themselves up. Right. And then, you know, eventually once you're healed, that'll go away. So I said, okay, so you're telling me. I'll be in less pain if I have an amputation basically for the rest of my life. Right. Like, yeah, you can look at it that way. So I said, okay, well, where's the paperwork? And well, <laughs> well, no, you need to, you know, talk about this with your, your significant other. I said, well, I, I don't have one of those. I'm divorced. <laughs> and well, talk with, with your mom and your, your kids are, well, the kids are like six and four. They, they, they're happy I'm alive. They right. don't care what I'm coming back with. So. I said, yeah, there's no, nobody else really that needs to be on the, uh, discussion consultation panel. I was like, this is it. So yeah, let's get this paperwork and let's schedule this surgery. ASAP. So, like, so you today. basically yeah. said, that's it. Just, just take it off because I don't want to deal with this anymore. Nobody needs yep. to look over the paperwork. Nobody needs to tell me, Hey, <laughs> let's consultation. Nothing. Just get it done. And that's it. And was, that's right. that, was, yeah. was that, was that a little hard for you other than the pain that you were having or mentally, was that a, a, a thing or just the pain was just too much. And you're like, that's it. I'm done. I, I, I don't have a choice. I'm done. I want, I want to stay yeah. off. I tell you, George, I thought about it for like less than three minutes. And I was like, yeah, oh. let's cut. cut I'm, I was like, let's cut our losses. Literally cut okay. my losses right now. So, wow. and they're like, no, we got to wait. You got to, you know, schedule surgery. And like, like, I right, well, let's schedule it ASAP sooner the better. Right. I was done. Okay. Yeah. The pain, the pain levels, like I said, the universe of pain that I was trapped in yeah. on the multiverse of pain. I was, yeah. I was ready to leave. I was like, yeah, I need to get out of here. Cause it's done. Right. It's besides being physically excruciating, it's mentally debilitating. And I could only imagine someone who has to endure pain on a daily basis for years or months. Mm -hmm. And you know, I only had it for a couple months and I was already at the end of my rope, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Wow. So, mm -hmm. wow. So how did you recover after the amputation? How long did that take? So once uh, they did the amputation and I spent maybe a day or two in the hospital after that, and then they rushed me off to uh, this extreme acute rehabilitation center over at Emory Hospital and uh, by Emory University. And Basically, it's like an acute rehabilitation where they try to rehabilitate you as quickly as possible to get you back home and back in the game of life. Right. So I was, I only spent maybe two weeks. Yeah, I was there for about two weeks um, after the surgery. And um, that's when I, uh, you know, went through learning how to transition myself from the bed to a wheelchair because um, I was, it's going to be a long process before I'd be ready to heal up enough the tissue and the flesh to be strong enough to put on a prosthetic leg. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you can't, you have to wait for a while. You can't just put it on right away cause your skin and flesh had <clears throat> stitches from the surgery and all that. Those, all that had to stay in place for uh, weeks, almost like a month, maybe a month and a half for, uh, those stitches could come out. Um, so I had to learn how to use a wheelchair, how to transition from a wheelchair to a bed, wheelchair to the bathroom, all that. Um, and mind you, it was harder because I still had a broken arm. You know, I still had, um, uh, the arm was, hadn't healed up yet either. So I could use it, but I didn't have full strength of that arm. Um, so I couldn't really put a lot of weight on it. 
There's a thing called uh, phantom limb pain. Could you give us some insight on that? Absolutely. So that's when I first experienced that was in the uh, rehabilitation center. And it's a real thing. A lot of people ask me about it all the time. That's like the number one question I get from total strangers on the street. And explain a little bit on what it is, like what, what exactly it is before you go into detail. Yes. So phantom pain is your brain having the memories of your body still having all four limbs and your, your brain, you can't erase those memories. You know, the brain is the, the, you know, powerful, most powerful computer on the planet. It never deletes anything. Everything is still stored up there. So it remembers. And I had, a, you know, since it happened when I was a grown man, I have a lot, I have more memories of having a leg than not having a leg. So the brain is still sending the nerve nerve endings are still sending those pain signals to the brain, even though there's no leg, there's no foot there to have any pain, but the brain is still processing it as if it is. So even though it's not there, the feeling in, of, uh, and every patient has different phantom pains. Okay. My phantom pain. Yeah. Was the, um, my brain was processing it as someone driving a railroad spike with a ball fiend hammer through the heel of my foot. That is no longer there. It's a phantom foot. But my brain doesn't know that it was still processing and making it feel like someone was driving a spike through my foot. And it would always hit me at like three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, three o'clock. It'd be dead asleep. And it would just, right. that would just, I could be dreaming about something else. And then that would hit me. And once it hits me, I would sit up straight up in the bed like Michael Myers in Halloween. And, and I, <laughs> it wouldn't be a pain where I would just sit up and start screaming like a maniac. Right. But it'd be a pain where it'd be like, like you're just clenching your teeth and, you know, wincing, like, cause it's, it's a pain that you can't do anything about cause it's right. a phantom. Right. So it's not like you, you can't massage your foot. You don't have a foot. It's gone, but your brain is still imagining Oops. it's there. Right. Wow, man. Yeah. That's so it's, uh, it's definitely a mental, it's all mental. Sorry it's more that. mental than physical. Sorry about that. Georgia. I, dropped, I, I dropped a couple of things yeah. here. <laughs> Tearing the, tearing the studio apart. <laughs> I, I, I hit something and the thing fell out. Sorry about that, man. Wow. No man. worries. Um, so, uh, yeah. Hmm. And, and, and a physical a physical therapist that was working me, with me at the acute rehabilitation uh, place, um, she gave me a – she's an old, old school physical therapist. She'd been doing it for like 30 or 40 years. And so she said a lot of patients, you know, that have trouble with it, she found that – if they massage that limb, the residual limb, also known as a stump, she said, if you massage it with your fingers, the nerve endings from your fingertips are touching that leg that's no longer there and Makes massaging sense. that stump there. And then your brain almost reconnects like, okay, I feel those nerve endings touching that. And okay, so there must not be anything there. So you're, it's almost a way of, you got to reboot, re rebooting your brain, like got to reboot, restart. Repro repro like, okay. Reprogramming. Yep. So, yeah, like a reboot reprogramming your your brain saying, "Hey, there's no leg mm -hmm. there. This is where I'm massaging yeah. now. This is exactly. it." Exactly. Wow. And, and it, it's like you got to clear the cash. Got to clear all those cookies and cash out. And right. once you restart it, it took a while for me, but it worked. Every time I woke up in the middle of the night, I would jump up and I would massage it. And there's a lot of different remedies. They, some people use heat, uh, heating pads, ice, compression therapy. I started using compression therapy too. Like a really, there's a prosthetic sock called a shrinker okay. and it's a shrinker because it helps shrink the limb um, from the swelling from the amputation gotcha. and basically the compression forces all that blood back into your body instead of swelling up at the end of that stump. And what you want to reclaim that blood that's swelling up in there. So it forces all that blood back up and, uh, and the shrinker compression helped uh, with the pain therapy. Gotcha. So on that mm -hmm. serious note, have you heard any jokes <coughs> about amputees? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, people ask me, and they're they're kind of serious, but they're kind of joking. Like, so do you sleep with your leg on? And I'm like, okay. why would I be sleeping with my leg on? Right. Well, I mean, so so when you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I was like, yeah, but I'm not walking. I need a leg to walk. <laughs> I don't need it to sleep. And they're like. Oh yeah, that's true. I was like, yeah, it, it's someone, and they're like, oh well, 
yeah, I guess that is kind of funny. Why would you need your leg on to sleep? I was like, no, nah, you don't need on to sleep. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And of course, I have, you know, my, my nasty friends that are so nasty. That <laughs> as we, so uh, you ever try to use your leg with, you know, your girlfriends? <laughs> the girls that you're with? I was, like, I was like, no, I don't try. <laughs> I'm not going to, you even use my leg like as a sexual aid, a device. <laughs> It's like, yeah, you never know, man. It you, might be you know, into it. You, you know what? I, I, I would try it. <laughs> I, I'm that sick. I would try it. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, I don't know, man. I've never tried it. I said, honestly, I'm not sure if I want to be with a girl who wants, to, who wants me for my amputated leg. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. Be- <laughs> you know, you can go on a first date, you know, and... Uh, and you're like, okay, you know, it's dark in the room. You don't, you know, she doesn't know anything. And you just go in with the leg. <laughs> Come on, man. You never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. I mean. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. That that would, that, <laughs> that would be something. Man. I mean. That would be something. What's the, what's the worst thing that can <laughs> she, she, <laughs> hey, listen, she'll be telling all her friends about you. Yeah, she she would, that'd be a story to tell. Got, man, that I dated this guy. I, I went out on a date last night and wow, dude. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. And let me tell you, after, after my surgeries, and that once I healed up and came out the hospital, I was extremely self conscious about even showing it. No. I was very, I didn't even want people to look at me. I would wear pants all the time. Right. Um, f- forget about dating. I was terrified to even ask the girl out for a date or try to show any interest because I was afraid that once they found out, you know, I lift my pants leg up like, oh my God, you're missing a foot. There's like, you know, a part of your leg that's gone and, yeah. you know, you're a freak of, you're a freak of nature. Get out of here. Right. What is wrong with you? Right. you know? So that was, uh, self-esteem was definitely uh, harsh on me. Um, it's, it's all mental too. A lot of my friends are like, oh, you're the same dude. And, you know, you know, everybody, you know, still likes you. Like, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, when we did a a little bit of planning for the show, um, Mm -hmm. we were talking about other people coming up to you and saying, oh, I feel your pain. I had X, Y, Z done. Could you (laughs) just. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Touch on that. Yeah. The the comparisons now those are the real jokes I find hilarious. Yeah. They might not find it funny, but because they're trying to be sincere. But for, to me, it sounds ridiculous. Like I've had people tell me about you know having an ingrown toenail surgery because they had to have the ingrown toenail surgically removed, and I I could understand it. I could imagine what you're going to. I, I feel your pain. I was like, yeah, you still have a toe, though, don't you? <laughs> you didn't get that removed, did you? Just a nail. Wow. That actually grows back. Right. And like, well, yeah, but uh, it was pretty painful. I, I, I'm sure it was. I can't imagine. Actually, I can. I've had ingrown toenails removed, and yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's a little painful. I it's a little it, painful, but, but it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, you know, having a bone saw to cut off a piece of leg from you right. and have to recover from that. It's not a good idea to come up to you and say, hey, I feel your pain, you know, when, when it's definitely right. not. I say it's a good idea is if you actually know an amputee and that right. amputee is expressed to you like, oh, this is how it feels. And that's a, but if you don't know any amputees personally, yeah. I mean, not just like you've seen them walking down the street, like you actually know somebody like a friend or someone, a family member. Right. Um, he's, yeah, I always tell people all the time, only an amputee can understand another amputee's pain. Right. Mentally and ph- mentally and physically, because um, right. it's a, a it's a huge mental, I would say, like a mental battle almost for amputees to. You know, a lot of amputees don't want to continue life and don't want to get back in the game of life, and they rather, you know, rather be gone. Like you know, I'd rather be dead than have a my arm missing or my foot missing or my leg or whatever. Well, have you met mm-hmm. other amputees? Yeah, a lot of uh, amputees, majority of my amputees I've met are online. I see them online from various support groups that I've joined over the years, a uh, couple years after my uh, surgery. Uh, but I actually have a, a friend who's a fellow photographer, like one of your many hats that you wear, George, that uh, actually became an amputee before me. And he was the first one as a friend, like a personal friend that I know because we worked together for years um, uh, at my job. And then, um, when his accident happened, had a heart, 
horrible motorcycle accident, um, he actually didn't have his amputated. Uh, like I had mine within a couple months. He waited almost a year uh, before he had his amputation done. And even back then, when I saw what he's going through and the pain and the suffering, and I always said to myself then, before my accident, that if that ever happened to me, I don't want to wait. I'm not waiting for a year. Right. I'm not. If the doctors think that, you know, whether you know they think they can save it or not, if it's not going to work the same way it used to work, then why am I keeping it? You know, I, right. just to drag, you know, be dragging around the anchor with you. So I already had made up my mind then, and ironically, unbelievably, you know, a few years into the future, it happened to me, and I've I basically stuck to my guns and did what I said I would do. Like, yeah, if I if he why, why am I saving if we can't, if I can't use it? And the doctor told me, he's like, yeah, honestly, you'll, you'll be able to be more mobile, more mobile and get around easier and less pain. And the infection doorway will be closed shut right. if you get it amputated, you know? So that was my thought process. Right. We, uh, yeah, we have, um, Dwight, uh, the photographer of Montgomery, uh, real cool guy. Yes, sir. When I was learning photography, I met him and uh, I learned from him because he's he's an amazing photographer. Oh yeah, somebody that I definitely I admire. And I met him, and and yeah, sure enough, he was missing a leg. And what he mm-hmm. does, wedding photography, oh, yeah. it's it's a very hectic day. You're running around everywhere, so you're five hours just me myself. Take you know, going back and forth, it's it's stressful. So having on your feet, having <laughs> yeah, you're on your feet and you're moving and you're going back and forth. So I found that very, you know, powerful that he can do that and he can still do that. And, and that's his passion, photography. Mm-hmm. So the, the prosthesis itself, <clears throat> you just don't get one fitted and use it throughout, right? It's like five, six, seven right. years. H- how does that work? So basically, they're custom fitted. So every amputee on the planet has to have one custom made to fit his his or her residual limb yeah. um, stump. <laughs> so you can't like reuse it or recycle it because they're custom made. Okay. And, Cause everybody's, everybody's residual limb is shaped differently. Um, shaped differently. You know, it's not like a, I always tell people it's not like a shoe. Like you go in the store and you know, I need size 12. Yeah. And you know, we got it. You're this right. is like, right. They, yeah, this is custom. Their size is, <laughs> Yeah, this it's kind of like dent, denture sir. implants and stuff like that. You just don't buy a set and yep. put it on or glasses. Right. It's custom right. made. Pop them in. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but um, you have to change it over, often. Yep. Over the years, um, like when I first got it, it was pretty, my residual limb was pretty big, pretty still swollen. So the first one I got was a pretty big one. Um, once the swelling went down and because you can't use that muscle anymore, whatever part of your leg got amputated, the residual limb is left, you'll never be able to exercise and make that muscle strong um, to grow. So it's going to continually atrophy and get smaller and shrivel and get smaller and smaller to the point where it stops atrophying. Right. Um, thank you. And thank God, you know, this happened to me in 2009. I think I stopped atrophying about maybe two years, three years ago. So it's not that long. So right. when you atrophy and you get smaller, or if you gain weight and get fatter, your, your stump might get fatter, residual limb might get bigger. So then you have to get another one to fit, you gotcha. know, exactly. Because if, if it doesn't fit, like also in comparison with your shoes, if it doesn't fit right, you're going to be, it's not like when you've got a pair of shoes and like, oh, it's rubbing your, your, your big toe the wrong way or your baby toe and you got corns or bunions. Yeah, people tell me that. I was like, oh, my corns and bunions are hurt. I'm like, yeah, when my prosthetic leg doesn't fit right, it's a little bit more painful than a corn or a bunny. Right, right. It's the, so you got to yeah, you got to get it painful. fitted. And how does that? Uh, what's the cost? And and does the insurance cover that? Um, it depends on the insurance company you have. Oh, okay. Um, I've been have been fortunate. Um, most insurance companies will cover a percentage of it. Um, most insurance I've had, thank God, since I've become an amputee, usually cover like 80, 80 to ninety percent. Oh, okay. Thank God of it. Um, the cheapest league I've had made was about 13,000. That was the cheapest one. The most mm-hmm. expensive one I had made was about 17, 17 or 18,000. So yeah, they're pretty much the cost of a used car. Right. So in closing, what do you recommend to others that might be going through what you have gone through? 
Um, I definitely reach out to, especially now there's so many, uh, support groups online, um, reach out to support groups online on Facebook, Instagram, whatever social platform and realize that you are not the only one out there that this has happened to whatever happened to you. Somebody else out there has happened to like, I, in the beginning, I was like, my God, this is amazing. I was like, I survived a head on car collision from a drunk driver. I was like, man, I, I wonder, you know, anybody else out there. And once I started meeting people, their accidents and, you know, stuff, a lot of people that had tragedies and that were so much more horrific and way worse than mine. I was like, Oh my God, that happened to you. You survived. I was like, damn. I was like, mine, mine doesn't sound that bad. I was like, I know one of my, uh, amputee friends, he got ran over by an 18 wheeler and got dragged for like a half a mile. And I was like, and you're alive. Like, how is that even possible? He oh. lost both of it. He's a double amputee and had uh TBI traumatic brain injury. And it's amazing. I like, he's, <clears throat> he's a, I, I think I, I mentioned his um, to you. He's a, one of the first double amputees to run the uh, Ironman triathlon in uh, Hawaii. Gotcha. And, um, yeah, which is insane to me. You're running the marathon and it's, swimming for a couple miles and riding a bike for another hundred miles. And right. He doesn't have, he doesn't have any feet. He has two prosthetic right. legs. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah, yeah we were ta talking about also, uh, master Sergeant Cedric King. Also, he does the marathon, the 26 miles. Mm -hmm. He does triathlons and these oh, are yeah. amazing, amazing people. Um, and he's, mm -hmm. he became a motivational speaker and this guy's strong, man. This guy, <laughs> I'll put you a gotta link. be. Yeah, I'll put a link because he even even he doesn't talk about his legs. He just talks about life and he talks <laughs> about other things. He never talks about his legs. Only at the beginning, mm -hmm. because people say, "Well, right. what's going on?" You know, you're walking on two right. poles, and he's got these huge paddles that 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 you know he runs on, and he's always yep. with them on. So that I find strange is that he doesn't wear pants. He wears almost like I Bermudas. Is that a, honestly, is there a I, reasoning for that? Yeah, honestly, once I got comfortable uh, in my own skin, you know, after like, you know, I'd say first couple of years happened in 2009, I'd say probably 2011, I got way more comfortable and started wearing shorts a lot, a lot more. Because one reason is one of the main reasons for me and most amputees is easy to put on, e got easy it. to put on. And sometimes if you're having a, a painful day with your prosthesis, you want to take the leg off. So if you have pants on, that means you got to go into a room, got to no. go in the bathroom, take your pants down, then take the leg off, right. adjust it, or massage it, do whatever you need to do to make it feel better. But if you have shorts on, you just pull the shorts up a little bit whoop, and then pop the yeah. leg off and yeah. you keep it moving. And I had a, a, a an Achilles tendon uh, rupture. Yeah. I was in pain and the standing and driving and walking I, I was in a you know not in a wheelchair but i was in a computer chair back and forth to the bathroom to the bedroom uh to go out to mm -hmm. pee it was you know i had my urinal because i didn't want to get up from the bed to get in the chair and go to i mean it was it, it, it was a, a traumatic thing and uh Absolutely. My muscle, my calf muscle atrophied as well. My one leg was just completely skin, you know, and then all of a sudden yeah. now. So I don't I'm not going to say I feel your pain because I don't. But I <laughs> I could imagine um, right. the problems, you know, and I, like mm -hmm. when I had my cast, I didn't care. I, I, I wear shorts all the time. Well, I always wear shorts, but, you know, I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to put pants on. You know, I don't care. No, you know, I would show it. It's like I said, it's the, it's the beginning. And I, I think almost every amputee I've talked to, you have to go through that because it's you gotta a brand go new. That. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a brand new way of life. And like I tell people, like there's a when, when you become an amputee, that's your new. That's a new life. That's your new normal. Yeah. So what you used to do before that, before you became an amputee, that life is gone. That's another lifetime. So I, I tell a lot of people like some stuff I don't remember before becoming an amputee, like. Like I was telling you, like, I don't have that many pictures of me before I was an amputee. Right. It was another life. <laughs> right. All right. It was another Eric. life. All right, Eric. It was mm -hmm. a pleasure to speak with you. Tell everyone how they can reach you. I'm on uh, a lot of times on Instagram, mostly between Instagram and Facebook. But um, on Instagram on there is off the hook 
zero zero, and that's basically my Gmail also, althug zero zero at gmail dot com. And you can find me also on Facebook the same way, althug zero zero at gmail dot com. And or look for my uh, my name, Eric Ford. It's not a well, that's a common name, but it's only I think I'm the only amputee Eric Ford on the planet. I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, listen. It was a pleasure to have spoken with you and to hear about your story and i'm sure a lot of people will listen in on Appreciate youtube you find this uh episode and find it helpful for them and educational and uh thank you for laughing with me on my weird sense of humor <laughs> absolutely i love to laugh bro all right buddy i will talk Appreciate to you, you soon all right guys if you guys have any comments please make sure you leave them in the comment field and you know, if you want to be on the show, hit me up, George at 360mix.com. Do you have any last words? Um, no, or, well, yeah. We'll good? say if you bump into if you bump into any amputees and you're curious about something, go up to them, talk to them, ask them. I mean, a lot of us are willing to, like me, I, I love to talk about it. So as you just saw, I have no problems with it. So don't be scared to say something. Perfect. Eric, it was a pleasure. I'll see you very, very soon, buddy. Thanks so much. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I definitely want to bring Eric Ford back. Why? Because he has history on music, hip hop, house music. He has a good plethora of information and knowledge about that music. And I want to know more about it. If you want to reach him, all you got to do is search for off the hook zero zero. And if you want to be on the show because you have something to say, you have a topic, you have something cool, reach me. George at 360mix.com is my email. You can see me on Instagram at 360mix or on Facebook, DJ, D E E J A Y, George Jet, J E T T. That's D E E J A Y, George Jet.